Welcome everyone to CQAR's Brilliant Minds Bold Questions, a five-part virtual event series exploring questions being addressed by some of the world's top researchers. Each talk pairs speakers from across disciplines, sectors, and the world to explore questions shaping our future. If you're not familiar with us, CIFAR is a Canadian-based global research organization that convenes extraordinary minds to address the most important questions facing science and humanity. My name is Kate Getty, and I am Senior Director of Research at CIFAR, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Leah Cowan and Matt Fisher today. Leah Cowan is the co-director of CIFAR's Fungal Kingdom Threats and Opportunities Program and Associate Vice President of Research at the University of Toronto. And her laboratory takes an interdisciplinary approach to understand what allows some microbes to explo exploit the host and cause disease and to develop new strategies to treat life-threatening infectious diseases. Uh, Matt Fisher is a fellow in CIFAR's Fungal Kingdom Threats and Opportunity Program and a professor at Imperial College London. And his research has shown that fungal pathogens are rapidly increasing in their impact worldwide owing to unique epidemi epidemiological features that allow them to behave as, quote, perfect pathogens that can drive entire species to extinction and emerge as novel human pathogens. Today's talk, titled, What is the Next Big Threat? will explore how our interconnected world is fragile, a lesson that has certainly been brought home through the pandemic of the last year. And as we start to look to a future beyond COVID-19, we wish to ask, what are the next big threats? And what if they come not from well-studied viruses or bacteria, but from little known fungi? Over the next 30 minutes, we'll hear from two of the world's foremost experts on fungal pathogens as they discuss how this long overlooked kingdom may be harboring our next greatest enemy. So I'll kick it off by asking a broad question to our speakers and we'll let them discuss various aspects of this theme for about 20 minutes. Then we'll take questions from the audience for roughly 10 minutes. So if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I'll, I'll read it to the speakers um, during the session at the end. So to, to start us off, uh, when we talk about the fungal kingdom, what are we talking about and why, uh, why are we worried? Great, thanks Kate for having us here. We're really thrilled to be here. And uh, that's a great way to start because most people have no idea what we're talking about when we're talking <laughs> about the fungal kingdom. So to provide a bit of context to start then, really it, they're pretty wild, these organisms. The best estimates suggest that there are at least 4 million different fungal species. And as a reference point, that's at least six times as many as there are plant species. These fungi are phenomenally diverse. They include single-celled tiny organisms that you can't even see with your naked eye, all the way to the largest organism on the earth, which is as massive as three blue whales. It's pretty cool for scope and scale. So this fascinating kingdom of organisms really underpin all life on earth. And it's a great example of how it's, it's rarely about good versus evil in biology. So the fungal kingdom presents lots of devastating threats. We're gonna focus on those threats today, but before we tell you more threats in our universe of threats, we're gonna to touch base briefly and share with you how there's amazing opportunities in the fungal kingdom. So fungi are super important for decomposing dead matter and recycling nutrients. Without fungi, it's thought that plants would never have colonized land. Fungi engage in really intimate partnerships that are super important for about 90% of all land plant species. Fungi are also an important source of nutritious food. We know there's at least 350 species that uh, humans consume as food. They're critical to production of bread, some cheeses, alcoholic beverages, and about 200 species are also thought to be hallucinogenic. So we know that fungi also produce a, a plethora of different life-saving medicines, including antibiotics, drugs that modulate immune function, and those that lower cholesterol. We also know that fungi are used to turn crop waste into biofuel, and they can also eat plastic, which is pretty neat. In fact, we think they may even be able to solve the world's plastic crisis down the road. So that's great that there's opportunities and we know of course that there's threats and that's what we're here convened for today. So I'm gonna share with you one perspective on threat and then turn it over to Matt, who's gonna broaden this out and, and scare everyone uh, profoundly. <laughs> so to start then, we know in terms of human health that there's about 200 species, that's a small number out of the 4 million, that are human associated and can cause lethal disease. They infect billions of people around the world and they kill about 1.5 million every year. 
So that outpaces mortality rates for malaria or breast cancer and is on par with that for tuberculosis and HIV. And there's really a, a silent pandemic right now with the spread of multi-drug resistant fungal pathogens, which really threatens the effectiveness of our limited arsenal of antifungals. So at that, I'm gonna turn it over because we know that fungi have really profound impacts on many other aspects of life on our planet. And Matt is gonna share some of those with us. Over to you. Hi, Len. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm talking to you from St. Mary's Hospital in London, um, where Alexander Fleming had this uh, serendipitous discovery involving a bacterium and a fungus, penicillium, which uh, kick-started the antimicrobial revolution. So fungi are fantastic creatures, but they are also deadly pathogens. And it's no exaggeration to say that they've caused a maelstrom of disease across the 20th century. Um, they pose a perennial threat to food security. If you manage to deal with the pestilences that fungi impose on our crops, then you could feed the bottom billion of the planet. So, you know, Bob Geldof, if you're listening, you could feed the world if you manage to stop the food security um, losses that are imposed by fungi. And um, they also are really potent pathogens to forests. So. Um, in, the, in North America, the chestnut blight wiped out the North American chestnut at the turn of the 20th century and numbers of species that went along. So they radically rewired that ecosystem. And, you know, in, across Europe at the moment, we're witnessing the loss of the ash tree caused by another fungus, which is exploding across our landscapes called Calara. So ash dieback is going to get rid of 12% of the UK's broadleaf ash forests. And that's of course got really kind of um, d huge implications for our ability to sequester carbon and deal with you know, the mitigating impacts of, um, of carbon that we have to rely on our forests for. But my particular interest is in fungi as animal pathogens and they have there I mean, obviously we're all living through COVID and we hate it and we, you know, it's, it's a terrible pathogen that literally is just nothing on the scale of what a fungus, which was really motoring along, can do. So the worst ever infection that we've come across is, uh, is a fungus. It's one of those small swimming ones, um, the microscopic fungus that Leo was talking about, called Vitracochytrum dendrobatidus, and that fungus has exploded across the world and is driving global amphibian declines. Um, it's worse than any other pathogen we've seen because it has caused so many amphibian extinctions across so many environments. And there are forests that you can go to, and I have gone to, where you don't hear frogs calling anymore. This is uh, uh, in the rainforests of South America and, and Australia where the disease was first detected. So, we kind of really, you know, I suppose the question we're asking here, Leia, is, you know, why um, are, we, are, are we seeing all this fungal disease? You know, what's, what's different? And the sort of lens that I like to view this through is, this, uh, is the globalization big bang. What humanity has done as it's really got good at trading and, um, across the planet and, man and manipulating environments. And, Fungi, which are, have these plas plastic and fantastic genomes and broad host ranges, are just really doing well in the environments that we're um, that we're giving to giving to them. And so that's on one hand they're able to move more broadly, far and faster. Um, but they also have this unholy trinity of epidemiological features. So if you, I suppose the best way to say this is, I imagine you may have watched Ridley Scott's Alien. So there you've got this pathogen that's sitting there in space. It doesn't care what comes along. It can wait for as long as it wants, but it's there ready and waiting, and you've got no immunity to it. And this is what many fungi do. They have these environmentally resilient stages which just wait and see. They, um, uh, the hosts often have no immunity, and the virulence can be 100%, whereas if you're thinking about um, COVID, it's, you know, it's, it's horrible, but it's less than 0.1%. So we're really dealing with um, quite in, uh, implacable foes here. Did that scare you enough? Uh, I'm good. 
<laughs> so I, I think that's that's wild, Matt. And and just to give that you know some some color, right? Those spores that can live for thirty years plus in the soil, and we know mm-hmm. that with coccidioides as an example, right? Which is uh, broadly found in the American you know Southwest and Midwest, and uh, there we have huge dust storms that are amplifying with climate change and bringing these spores forward for which we have no vaccine, as I understand it, and, and really very limited uh, to no cures available for this. So it's pretty wild. And, you know, we, we know uh, what to be concerned of, of of the species we currently know, but there's this whole sort of new paradigm that we think about in terms of emerging threats, right? And, and emerging threats uh, have come to the fore really in the context of COVID. We know that uh, when we, we don't know what we're dealing with and we have no interventions, it, it can take a devastating toll. We know that fungi are actually also causing uh, havoc in the context of COVID patients. Mm-hmm. We know that uh, there's a, an emerging issue right now we're seeing broadly in India with the black fungus, which is a mucor fungus. Uh, it's a mold commonly found in soil and plants and, and even in, in nasal cavities of healthy people, but it's seeming to cause sort of huge damage uh, and even some deadly disease in recovering COVID patients and partially the underlying defects in immunity uh, that arise, but also the steroid treatments and other interventions can really make humans more vulnerable uh, to many of these these pathogens. So we know that also the the COVID uh, seems to be uh, making uh, patients more vulnerable to Aspergillus infections. We've seen outbreaks of another fungus called Candida auris, which is a, a really cool one as well. And I, I know in terms of emerging fungi, Matt, you've done some beautiful work thinking about where do they come from and some brilliant detective work of trying to figure out where are sort of the hot spots for where the next threats are coming. So I wonder if you want to share any, any thoughts about sort of origins or where should we be looking for some of these deadly emerging uh, threats? Yeah, so, I mean, what you've been alluding to here is this deep well of biodiversity that comp- comprises the fungal kingdom and is just spectacularly enormous. Uh, we really have, we've described 5% of what's out there. And what happens when you, you know, you start seeing amphibians simultaneously dying in, in uh, Australia and, and South America? You know, you have to ask the question, what's the process here? Is it that the frogs are sickening from up some other um, undetected process? I mean, you were just talking about COVID there. So mucomycosis is showing that fungal characteristic of just seeking out a resource as soon as it opens up. And that's patients who have got COVID and diabetes. So perhaps that was what was going on with the frogs. So what my lab does is we go out there in the environment and we collect the fungi. And that's not as easy as it sounds because these uh, places are often very remote. And actually, for, uh, these pathogens are really quite difficult to culture, um, surprisingly so, seeing as they, you know, <laughs> they're supposedly so deadly, and they are. But what we would then do is sequence their genomes. And the approach that really works when you're doing these, attacking these global prob- um, problems is everyone needs to buy in. And if you have scientists that are trained in a technique that you've developed around the world, contributing isolates of, 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 of the, the trachea in this case, then you have a chance of looking for genetic, genetic characteristics that are associated with its point of origin. And certainly that was where we got lucky because we got enough samples from across the planet to find the signature of the ancestral lineage in its heartland, which turned out to be um, South Korea. And so, and, you know, using molecular clock estimates, we were then able to show that the, the, the frog chytrid had essentially blasted out of that niche um, in the early half of 20th century, 20th century and is now found across the planet with, you know, um, these attendant uh, losses of biodiversity in amphibians. And you can kind of recreate that process for other fungi such as Candida auris and so on and so on. And through that genomic lens, you really start to appreciate um, where these uh, sources of, of fungal biodiversity are, which gives you some eyes on the problem that you previously didn't have. Absolutely, I think those are great mm. points, and I and we've alluded to a lot of interesting themes relevant to you know how fungal impacts on the planet have changed in the Anthropocene, right, or the the period of Earth's mm. history where human activity has really shaped the planet's climate and ecosystem. 
And I think there's some some really interesting examples. You talked a little bit about trade uh, and, and a little bit about agriculture. You know, we think a little bit about how, uh, you know, climate change is selecting for organisms that can grow at higher temperatures. Mm-hmm. And there's some really interesting uh, thinking out there that uh, it's really our high body temperature that wards off fungal infections. So that's why there's only a few hundred fungal species that can currently cause disease in humans out of the you know, many millions that, that we talked about. So we note then that as, as climate uh, change occurs and we have elevated global temperatures, we're really selecting for fungal pathogens. We're selecting for fungi that can grow better at higher temperature. We're narrowing that, that window of protection and we think that that might be what's happened a little bit with Candida auris, right? Where uh, we know that in you know 2009, it just emerged in multiple continents, uh, really diverse lineages, suggesting that the organism had been around for quite a long time to accumulate all this variation. Some sort of global selective force happened, and then all of a sudden, we see it really across across the planet, uh, causing disease. As a neat example of how climate change can really uh, select uh, for for new pathogens and new host ranges. So Matt, I think a lot about you know agriculture as well and, and how our sort of monoculture and lack of genetic variation in some of our crops really puts us at risk. So I don't know, thinking like wheat is a really cool example of that or bananas and wonder if you might wanna share some perspective on those. Yeah, I mean, did you know that the largest wheat field, I learned this from Sarah Gurr, is 14,000 hectares big. So that, there on that field, you've got a monoculture. Um, which is, you know, that's if you have a fungal genotype or some of, 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 of wheat blast on that, then you really have a problem. So, you know, because the, just the power of amplifying that geno, genotype is so high. So, you know, obviously, intensive agriculture of that magnitude, you have to use chemicals on an unparalleled scale to, 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 for crop protection. And looking at the recent um, azol usage uh, for the United States, the, in, the increases in, in azole, azoles are the kind of primary crop protectant against um, fungi. Those, uh, this, those increases are, are spiraling. They're almost exponential in the amount of usage that's um, being needed to do to protect crops these days. And that's just testament to how the fungi are evolving away from the crop protection. And then that's spilling over into the, you know, when you have the off target from into fungi that affect humans, say Aspergillus fumigatus, which is in every breath you take, then yeah, but if you if you are immunosuppressed, then your clinician has got a uh, has got a problem. And you know you work with doctors who uh, who deal with these these infections on a daily basis, and they're, they're not they're not easy infections to treat, are they? No, absolutely. So so many interesting threats, and and it. You know, in context, it's it's interesting because we can look at the really broad history of, of our planet and kind of look back, you know, 66 million years ago and think about how fungi may have really changed the entire distribution of, of species. And, you know, there's some interesting models out there. I wonder if, if uh, do you want to share some thoughts on, on the impact of fungi in context of dinosaurs and mammals and and anything yeah, else. I mean, so you know, and, and you you alluded to it. Where our body temperature is thirty seven degrees, and that's that's a major hurdle for your for your your average fungus. You know, there are about two hundred that um we know presently that are able to do that. So yeah, so the the it's called the um this ancient fungal catastrophe is the fungal infection mammalian selection hypothesis. And it's an argument for why there are no dinosaurs left on the planet. So the argument runs like this. 65 million years ago, a meteorite struck um, the planet and caused a global cooling event. So at that point, the major vertebrate biodiversity was dinosaurs and their body temperature dipped at the same time that all the forests died. And essentially a compost earth was created. So, those decomposing fungi that produce billions of spores overwhelmed the immunosuppressed dinosaurs, but not the little squirrely mammals that were in the undergrowth that had high body temperatures. And so, you know, that compost earth opened up a vast ecological niche that the, you know, the, the warm um, mammals were able to radiate into. And, you know, here we are, the rest is history. 
It's so cool. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful, and there is actually experimental evidence because of the, there's the line of fungal spores at the KT boundary. So, you know, the geologists are in on this particular hypothesis as well. Absolutely. So I, I think Kate has just uh, appeared. So that tells me there's a transition and mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to Kate to help us guide through this. Yeah, wonderful, Leanne, Matt. That's, that's a uh, fantastic introduction and, and summary of sort of what we understand so far. Um, I'm going to, we've been getting some questions and I'll remind other audience members, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the, the Q&A section. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll even just start with the question that we put at the outset or the, the title that we give to the talk, which is what is the next big threat? And um, from what I've been hearing you say so far, it sounds like we don't know. <laughs> is, is that fair? That do you I, I, would, <laughs> I would say that's, that's what we what what we say is we know there will be a next big threat posed by a fungal kingdom. I would, you know, I have absolutely no doubt, just going on past experience and the accelerating trends that we're seeing, uh, you know, fungi will evolve to every control method that we, um, uh, you know, impose on them currently. And also they're gonna to respond to these Anthropocene drivers that we're, that we're giving them. So it's, you know, it's really up to people like Leia to come up with new and very funky ways of, um, of, of, of combating this emerging threat, because we don't know what it is. Absolutely. So Kate, I wonder if we could build one of the questions in, which was just, is there sort of high throughput, uh, massively parallel ways to screen for antifungals? So yeah, yeah to, that's where I was going to go next. Go ahead. Excellent. Do you want me to work on so I'll read, I'll read out the question because it's actually from one of CIFAR's other co the co-director of the Learning Machines and Brains program, but he asks if there are known ways to massively screen candidate antifungals, um, for example, uh, using synthetic biology to generate many such candidates, and if so, can AI be of use? Yes, and yes, and I would love to work with you. So <laughs> that's how we open it. So we do tons of that kind of work in my lab. That's actually uh, our general approach to biology is we do huge, large scale, both chemical biology screens, so screening really large collections of really diverse molecules. So 300,000 compound collections, you know, of that kind of scale. So whether that's massive enough, that's uh, it's, it's where we're starting. And we screen really different kinds of libraries of molecules. Some of them are natural products where we think these molecules are tuned over the course of evolution. They're produced by organisms to have biological effects. So we screen natural products, we screen synthetic molecules, and we do all kinds of really elegant screens to find those that can either kill the fungus or can abolish drug resistance or can specifically impair or disable uh, virulence mechanisms or the ability to cause disease. So depending on the kinds of screens, we get really different kinds of molecules. Uh, we can also take sort of a, a genetic based approach where we're building these really large scale uh, mutant collections where we can take out every single gene individually in the organism's genome or reduce the levels of the gene product. And by doing so, we can identify all of the genes that are required for the pathogen to survive, all of them that are required for drug resistance or causing disease. And then by linking those two approaches, we can figure out which molecules target those interesting gene products and then sort of optimize programs to really engineer fungal selective molecules. Because a challenge is that fungi are actually much closer related to animals than they are to plants, even though it may not look like it. Uh, but their cell walls are made of something called chitin, which is actually in lobster shells. <laughs> and they're, again, much closer to animals. So a key challenge is really once we get these interesting molecules is making sure that they're really selective to kill the fungus and not take down the host uh, along, along with it. So we do those screens and definitely amenable to AI to be able to learn the rules for, you know, what's required to get molecules inside of fungi. They have thick walls and active uh, machinery to pump stuff out of cells. So definitely amenable and, and uh, we're, we're really interested in working in that space. Terrific, thanks for that answer, Leah. Um, there are a number of questions, I think just trying to get a sense of the, the scope of um, threat to humans. And one of the questions has been, for example, why does the world not know more about deaths due to fungal infections? Um, or maybe put another way, is the rate of fungal devastation increasing every year or is it that we're more aware due to advances in research? Matt, do you want to lead with that one? Yeah, I mean, fungi do, they are devastating um, diseases and they, you know, they're, they're on par with malaria and TB. Um, in, the, in, the, in the mortality and burden disease that they cause. What's, 
different about fungi is it's very hard to know what to do with them. And this is where advocacy for the problem kind of falls off. They're, they're a polyglot group. There's, there's lots of different fungal infections. Um, they're opportunistic and environmental. So often, you know, uh, a good example of that is we first recognized um, and learned about HIV AIDS because of a rare fungal infection which started appearing again in San Francisco. That was pneumocystis. So it's, a, it's an under, underlying marker of, um, of, 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 another, of another problem. So to deal with pneumocystis, you really have to deal with HIV AIDS. Um, so that's, so that's, that's, that's a, a, you know, another, another problem. But I think there's generally just a, a, lack, of, um, a lack of appreciation and advocacy in the, general, uh, in the general epidemiological area in public health arena, which is changing quite rapidly as fungi move into CDC databases and World Health Organization um, antimicrobial resistant surveillance programs. So this, this is being addressed at the moment. Um, I know, Leah, you can see the questions as well. They're, they're, it's wonderful. I mean, I think it speaks to the, the breadth of researchers that you brought together in the C4 Fungal uh, Kingdom program as well, covering the, the, the span from, from agricultural to human health to um, you know, the biodiversity work that you, the, uh, that you work on, Matt. Sorry, Leah, I've just lost my questions. Do you want to read one from the, the Q&A yourself? Are you able to see them? Yeah, I mean, maybe one of the, the questions that was up at the beginning was looking at sort of antimicrobial resistance and, and superbugs and had the potential to send us back to an era where simple infections could kill with the current use of so many antibiotics and antifungals uh, due to complications arising from COVID infections. What role could this play in dealing with, you know, in the future, more fatal outbreaks? <laughs> So for antifungals, you know, those that we can use to treat systemic fungal infections, so invasive infections, we have so few. We have three different classes of antifungals to treat these invasive infections. That is not a lot. That is compared to several dozen classes of antibacterials where we still have a huge, you know, looming crisis with antibiotic resistance. So part of the challenge is, again, that fungi are so closely related to humans. So it's really, really challenging uh, to develop drugs that selectively kill the fungus. Another part of the challenge uh, is that there's been a lack of investment in this space and it's an understudied, underfunded area. So it's a huge you know, importance and that's why we've assembled this team to really tackle this kind of grand challenge. But part of it is also, as, as Matt alluded to, the really wide use. We, you know, we have three classes and one of them is used incredibly broadly in agriculture. So Matt, I know you've been tracking this with looking at how you know, the, the use of you know, thousands of tons of, of azoles in agriculture has selected for resistance that can then spread to the clinic. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, I mean, that's, this is the problem of dual use, you know, because there are so many, so few opportunities, um, chemically speaking, to, to deal with fungi. Both the agriculturalists and the clinicians use the same class of drugs often. And uh, azoles are used in million, millions of tons a, a year, both in, the, in, the, in agriculture and in the clinic. And, you know, if you're in the environment, and you evolve resistance there, and you get into a patient, then it's a very hard infection to treat. So this is why we need people like Leia and her lab to go forth and actually find something different. And the chat actually did mention RNA, and there's a lot of really exciting movement in the RNA eye space. So, um, you know, we'd, um, we're, lo we're looking forward to a, a bright future uh, in terms of uh, those new therapies. It's amazing. And just to maybe add, I know we're close to time here, Kate, but the kinds of things we do by bringing together really different people is is amazing. So we've got people working on, you know, vaccine for the bats, right? Who would have thought about that? <laughs> so it's totally wild. Matt talked about a fungus that's killing off bats, I think, earlier. Uh, and that that's a, a huge issue. And we had a a pediatrician, <laughs> a fungal a pediatrician who's an expert on infectious disease, who teamed up uh, with a wildlife biologist. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, a brilliant story about these people who came together, brought together these really different areas of expertise and have done incredible work. And they have a vaccine that looks like it could help save the bats from this deadly fungus and they can deliver it on the surface of the bats backs and then they groom each other and ingest it. I mean, it's, it's totally amazing. So I think that's, uh, how we're dealing with all these sort of unknown threats is, is we just bring together incredible people who are, you know, all eyes are <laughs> focused on, on what's happening around us and figuring out where are these threats and how do we best tackle them. 
Well, thank you so much, Larry and Matt, for sharing your insights with, with us today. I'm afraid that's all that we have time for. Um, for everyone who's joined us, thank you as well. Uh, please visit our website, cfr.ca, to find out more about this series and to view recordings of previous talks. And the recording from this talk will be posted early next week. Thank you all. Take care.